So, Gary, do I have your permission to use this interview um, for the film that I'm working on, Nimitz Encounters? No, yes, sir. Um, so, if you could just state your name and your rank at the time. In uh, uh, at the time, I was uh, Gary P. Voorhees, fire controlman, third class. Uh, I was an Aegis computer technician and a CEC operator. So, paint a picture of the ship you were on and what your job was. All right. So, um, I was on the USS Princeton, CG-59. Um, my job was to uh, load crypto and take care of the CEC machinery um, and all the mainframe computers that run Aegis, the Aegis weapon system. So when you had flight operations going on and you guys were in CEC, um, what does CEC stand for and what, what did you see in your fellow workers there? Um, CEC is Cooperative Engagement Capability System. Um, it, uh, uses a system just to converge all of our uh, environmental data and our uh, weapons data to be able to fire non-line of sight and to give us uh, operational capabilities of all of our ships. And what does CIC stand for and what is that in your ship? What is that room? Uh, combat information and it's, uh, it's basically where everything is. It's where all our big screens are, it's where all our consoles are, it's basically where everything is going. That's where all the triggers and the buttons are pushed. <laughs> and that week of November 10th, so around there, um, what was the first time you became aware of some unknown contacts? Well, actually it was, uh, I, got a, I got a call from the spy guys, which uh, there's an entire different ages tech that runs the actual spy radar itself, and they said that they've got a bunch of clutter and that they need to take the system down to uh, uh, calibrate the system to try to get rid of the clutter because they they got basically invisible track you know, tracks that are coming up that can't be there, and uh, so they're basically insane tracks, and uh, so they took the entire system down, they calibrated everything, brought it back up, and the only thing it did was make the tracks clear, more clear. So then at that point, you know, they knew that they were actually tracking objects. And for, uh, well, it's 14 years ago, so it was between three and five days, we tracked a bunch of unknown aircraft. And then at a certain point, we did a F-18 interrogation of it. And I remember, uh, because all week we've, you know, we've been looking at these things through the big eyes. We've got our own personal binoculars. We've been staring at these things flying around. And, you know, I mean, it was, uh, everybody was kind of, yeah, some people were excited. Some people didn't know about it because, I mean, a lot of the information was still classified, you know. So, I mean, we didn't, you know, obviously we weren't telling the deck seamen about, you know, the unknowns we're tracking. But. You know, anybody that had clearance, anybody that had anything to do with the radars, we, we all knew. And so I, I was spending a lot of time in combat and I was spending a lot of time, you know, just kind of sitting in my computer room watching the data and just watch, making sure my recordings are, are going because I was also responsible for all the recordings for CIC. So all the talkbacks, all the data going over all the consoles, all that runs through our system because we were also testing... Uh, what they called Q70 at the time, which was the new baseline of Aegis at the time. It was a hybrid system with an old system and a new system tied in together. And so at this point, you guys are pretty sure that this isn't radar clutter or Yeah, we were, we were 100 percent positive it was not. And we were, I mean, we, we sat around just wondering why they're not doing something about it. Why are, why are they not checking this out? Why aren't we you know, why aren't we, why aren't we firing at them? Why aren't we, you know, they're invading our airspace. So it's like, it, you know, we were kind of all kind of sitting there just in the dark about exactly what we were dealing with. And then the day they did the intercept, uh, everybody with a clearance was sitting in, in somewhere where there was a, a link to the land and we were all watching the actual interrogation as it was happening. And I remember it was, it was just, you know, it was absolutely amazing. You know, we, we're seeing these things up close. It's one thing to see it from a heck of a distance through the big eyes and the big eyes, 
are pretty good binoculars and we still you, know, you still couldn't quite grasp the shape so you knew, you knew that it was there and that's why they were called tic tacs but you couldn't grasp the shape or the design or the way that it looked and it would, in the video you could see it you know you could see the way that they looked they see the way that it moved that it actually changed shapes and you know it it was just the oddest thing and you know i was like oh my god you know that's that's absolutely amazing you know what i mean and then you know seeing what it was doing you know it was going to you know over 25,000 feet and then coming down in you know no time zero time at all i mean like you could blink and it was already there you know i mean it was so ridiculously fast i mean and the turns that it made and the way that they moved were um as far as i know beyond the laws of physics you know so i mean it was to me uh amazing that there was another layer of physics that we haven't even achieved yet and that we you know for me it was a, an open door to something new so you know i was super excited about it and then uh I went back to uh, actually make a recording of it off the secret land, so on my secret computer, so that I could keep, so I could study it and rewatch it. And by the time I got back down to the computer that I watched it on, because we had it downloaded onto that hard drive to make a copy, it was already gone. And you're talking about <clears throat> the, the part or, or a lengthier version of the one that we see now. Yeah, it was a much one. it was a much clearer video. Um, it you could see the shape of the ship you could see it you know moving you could see uh you know and it, what's what's funny is even when i think back to it as indistinct as it was it was, it was completely dis discernible when you were seeing it so it was it and it moved and i know it changed shape and but it's like it honestly it's hard to remember uh it's been kinda, a long time yeah and <clears throat> Before you saw that, because you said you saw it in real time, Commander Fravor didn't have the Atfleer on his jet and his wingman. They they were wings clean. Um, is there any? Did you were you able to see any video from him, or did you hear his radio? I'm not sure exactly what plane the video came from. Only that I actually got to see the video as it was being recorded, and it was the same video that was released. Um, so I mean, so one of the planes had to have been rolling. Yeah, and the it, second flight with the guy Chad Underwood, he's the one that filmed it. Okay. So after Fravor came back, he told those guys, get a, get a pod, and then they went up and, and filmed okay. it. Okay. Um, so then I wasn't even aware of uh, Favor's flight then. And you heard, do you hear the radio too? Um, anytime I was in combat, I, I could, I could, I popped in. Anytime it seemed like everybody was getting a little excited, I'd pop on and listen to what they were saying. And seeing the tracks, it, they would actually go faster than our, our pulses. So we were only, see, it was, the tracks when you saw them, it would almost be like it was a, if you, if you could actually see the track in real time, it would have been like a dotted line because we weren't hitting it every time because it was moving so quickly. Um, but it, it, it was honestly amazing. And you guys, I mean, you weren't, you weren't the spy guy, so you weren't literally selecting one of the targets yeah. and then watching it or did you see the playback no we weren't the the os's deal with the consoles the operational specialists they, they they're the console runners we're the we're the grunt techs you know we we get to see all the backing the back wiring and the you know the consoles and you know we got access to cic and we got the clearances to be everywhere you know so i mean i was just a fly on the wall the whole time you know so so, I mean, I guess I'm first-hand witness to everything, you know. I mean, I was glued to those contacts. Every time there was a new one, I got excited, you know. And uh, What about, so you guys decide, hey, let's go up on and look at these things through the big eyes. Mm -hmm. Tell me, describe what, what that day was like. Well, I mean, there was actually, uh, they <laughs> finally restricted it. But for a while, we were just taking turns. I mean, there was just... Uh, Everybody that was actually interested in it was just up there. And believe it or not, there was a good chunk of people that just pretended like it was just another day. And, and describe it, because I think the people that watch this don't know the structure of the boat and what those things, the, it's like a big mounted Yeah, document. so if you go and uh, if you look at the CG-59, the USS Princeton, you look at the forward of the structure where the... Um, where you actually see the glass for the, the bridge so and on both sides of the bridge there's th these 
platforms that jut out from left and right and they have big eyes on them which are big huge tele uh, bi uh, telescopic binoculars and uh, you have to actually go up and around the bridge and get onto the bridge wing to actually look through them so not everybody's going to go up there and, and when you're out at sea you kind of have to be a special kind of person to walk out on the bridge wing to look at them and uh, that's why after I had seen them a couple of times I just kind of retired back to my own binoculars which actually ended up being a clearer picture of them anyways. So how far away and describe what you saw through the binocular? Uh, through the binoculars they basically just looked like little specks like like you could see you could you could tell and it would just they'd be there then it wouldn't be and then you'd see another one and you don't know if it's another one or if it's just the same one but it just disappeared and then came back to the same spot you know so I mean it's kind of like seeing a bunch of gnats, but you know that they're tracks and that they're large objects. You know, they're, they're, they're not just a, you know, just a random pattern in the sky. Did you try looking at them in the day or only at night? I've seen, I tried looking at them day and night. I couldn't see them at night. Um, during the day, I could see the specks. I could see them moving around, but you couldn't, you couldn't make them out at night. At least I couldn't. So, um, now with my binoculars, uh, I was able to see a little bit clearer, but it's still just kind of, it's kind of like if you're trying to look at a cruise ship while it's coming right over the horizon. You, you kind of, you know it's a cruise ship. You can't tell what kind, or you know it's a ship, but you don't know what kind it is. You don't really can't, you can tell, you tell the general shape, but other than that, you couldn't tell anything real discernible about it. And it didn't matter how close they got. So going back towards the end of this thing where, you know, it was sort of the end of the sightings, um, you told me how you were part of a smash and crash uh, team. And I wanted to like tie this into what PJ said, which was that these guys came and wanted to chain of custody of the bricks and so on. So, and you happen to be, you happen to see the helicopter. So I was sitting behind the uh, smash and crash team when the, the, when we actually had a helicopter come on board and I saw uh, just Plain clothes guys come on board, you know, just normal suits, um, and a couple, you know, it looks like a couple of officers. Um, and then about maybe 15, 20 minutes later, I get called down to combat to sign over all of the data recordings. And they take, and they wiped CEC too. They didn't, they didn't, I don't know whether they remotely downloaded off CNC, uh, but they wiped our CEC. We had to reload the whole thing. But you can ask PJ, it's a pain in the ass. I know you probably can't use that. But. So, so, the, so um, go back, because I don't, I mean, I had to look it up and, and maybe just say what Smash and Crash, what that, why you were there. Uh, I was there because I was basically trying to be a part of the Smash and Tash, Scratch team because you got extra money for it. I mean, I don't, I think just fine. Oh, it. so what they do is it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of sailors that volunteer to sit in the hangar in case the helicopter crashes. <laughs> so if the helicopter crashes, uh, if the helicopter crashes, then we rush out and we start putting out fires, trying to trying to pull people out of the wreckage, that type of thing. So it's uh, matter of fact, Jason could tell you a lot more about it. He's he was he was on it for a long time. You know, me, I did it for a little bit for an extra money. Just happened to be there that day. <laughs> and uh, but he uh, he could tell you a lot more about the actual crash mess team. Great. So and then. Was it common for guys to come in and ask for this stuff or? T no, no, no. Uh, my tapes generally, they just get flipped over and erased and then written over. Um, the general information, because other than when we went to, uh, if we did field testing, if we went out to the missile range, stuff like that, they'd come and take the tapes, but it was only for, to you know, for just basically environmental data, see how well the systems work and stuff like that. Um, like he said, you know, sometimes the companies that, you know, built these machines would come in and take the tapes just for, you know, checking out how their systems are working. Um, and then the only other times that I ever had anybody come and take tapes was uh, when we had a, uh, a drone crash into our ship. Uh, I, we, we were testing the, the SeaWiz and SeaWiz had chopped the chain on the on the drone and it actually flew into our ship and crashed into our ship so they wanted the tapes from that too so um but it wasn't like this they basically they waited till we hit port and then they came in they just said hey we just need the tapes for you know the the drone 
crash and you know we just handed them over to them no bit no chain of custody no nothing but in this situation people came on board there was a chain of custody my chief uh, came on you know got me I had to sign chain of custody for them and basically I just signed my name and this person that picked it up which I have no idea who they were signed it and they took them and I was told that if there was any other tapes to delete them even if they're brand new so I went through all of our tapes and I deleted absolutely everything. So. Where do you think that helicopter originated from? Uh, I would guess the Nimitz. I mean, it would have to have come from the Nimitz. I mean, I don't know flight operations. So, I mean, I'd generally, I'd, I'd, I'd have to, it'd have to come from the Nimitz. I'm sort of using speculation and conjecture to put these guys or wanting chain of custody and taking this data and this intercept in the Hawkeye, you know, I'm putting those two together and saying, oh, they're related. It certainly seems that way to me, but do you, is there like any other um, reason do you think they wanted that, that could it just be, are we putting these two things together and maybe they aren't related? Mm, there's no way it couldn't be related. I mean, it's a very specific set of data about the same event. So, I mean, <laughs> how do we think, or how do you think personally, that these people got on board so fast after the incident? Would they have had to known before it even began and been sent out? Well, on, on, like what he didn't know is this, we'd been tracking them for days. I mean, the chain of command knew. So, I mean, there was plenty of time for these guys to get on board. There was plenty of time for the guys to come and... Uh, over to the carrier, you know, even from the mainland. Yeah, you know, we weren't really that far. We were within flight distance of islands that you could have easily, they could have come out. So they had plenty of time to get out there. You know, so if they knew we were going to do an intercept and they knew that there could be a possibility of us actually having this flight data, then they would have been ready. They would have already been there and ready to go to come, come get it. And then just personally, outside of, you know, any experience in combat and that knowledge, what do you think that those objects were? Um, looking at an engineering and a physics standpoint, uh, I didn't understand how they could do what they did. And the only thing I knew that they were a technology that was far beyond anything that I knew about, that I even know about to this day. Um, I don't know where they're from, whether they're, they're, you know, I don't really have a good working theory on it. And it's, it's, it could be just our government testing out pretty advanced tech on ourselves just to see whether or not it will work. You know, it could have been an advanced drone that we were, they were, they were testing, you know, that could have been some type of new, uh, you know, system to, you know, do mock, you know, show us mock mock uh, sightings you know or you know there's there's a there's a lot of things that i've thought about it could be so i mean there there's i just try to think about it rationally um you know i don't want to jump to any conclusions you know i mean it was just the only thing i can honestly say about it is just it was just an amazing display of technology and whether it was a uh, a system that we were developing or something beyond that you know i i'm not gonna speculate on exactly its origins or anything like that but it was it was pretty amazing kevin said he had some profound after effects of looking at it through the big eye you also had the exact same exposure so to speak have you noticed anything or? um not that i can really contribute to that um Honestly, uh, my whole time on that last deployment, uh, you know, we had uh, we had a lot of stuff happen. You know, we had a lot of, you know, I had a lot of stuff happen to me in the service too. So, you know, it, there's a lot of things that just war. Yeah, you know, it, when you know you're responsible for literally thousands of people dying, you know, it's you know, and a lot of things weigh on you. So it's just uh, you just try to. Uh, you just don't even you don't even think about it you just try to keep moving on and i don't know if that that particular event had any profound effect on me i do know after the deployment and from the time i got out of the service which was pretty soon after that event 
um, I've been a much mellower person. You know, I, I have a very clear and defined way I think. I do think more organized. You know, I do think more rationally. I've always been a rational thinker, but I was, um, I, I did get a bit colder, but then again, like I said, it could just be PTSD. You know, I, I don't know whether it was PTSD from other stuff in the service or whether it was just from that one event, but honestly, the event m amazed me because I've been a skeptical believer my whole life in uh, that there there's advanced technology on this planet, you know, and it's just whether or not, you know, now I know that there's, you know, there's a whole nother layer of physics and, you know, and, uh, you know, engineering that just hasn't been touched yet. So, uh, do you think that there's other uh, shipmates and other military personnel that were there and so on that even have like a more amazing story because they saw it close up? Or oh, I would love to get one of the spy guys. You know, I mean, those guys worked directly on the system that tracked it. I mean, one of the few systems that apparently, I mean, I mean, from what I understand, some of the systems couldn't see them. You know, a spy was able to see them bright as day. Can, so. spy, can spy create like a three dimension? I mean, on, that may be classified. No, no spy doesn't do three dimensions. Yeah. Um, anything three dimensional would have been had to use multiple ships data right. to make a three dimensional picture, which is, you know, that's just a whole nother system. Yeah, <laughs> that you can't talk about. Right? <laughs> Never can, right? Yeah. All right, I think I'm done. And you want to add anything I didn't ask you or that you wanted to talk about? Um, you know, I just would like to say that, you know, there was, you know, there was over... You know, 400 people on my ship and 5,000 people on the carrier. I mean, there's got to be some other people out there that, you know, can collaborate the story and, you know, fill us in where our memories failed us. I mean, this was 14 years ago. I mean, I could have gotten things wrong easy because we all remember things the way we want to remember them, you know? So, because I want to believe in certain things, I'm going to remember it a certain way, you know? It's like, for me, it was an amazing situation where I saw some crazy advanced technology that made my day. You know, to other people, it was a religious experience you know so i mean everybody has a, a different outlook on what happened so i would love to hear and collaborate with you know anybody else that decides that they wanted to come forward and you know discuss it and talk about it because i mean it happened there was no there's no ifs ands or buts whether it happened or not it did happen so i'd love to know if there's anybody that does know more about it so fill in our gaps so, so <laughs> if people um, contact Anon, Anon at the I, I can put them in touch with you guys. Yeah, I'll talk to anybody that wants to talk. You know, even if they want to be off completely off the record and not talk to anybody that's making a film or trying to do an interview, if they just need to talk to somebody about it, you know, because I know like people like Kevin, it, it really deeply affected them. You know, I mean, it literally affected every aspect of their life. Yeah, you know? so there's got to be other people that are dealing with that same thing. So if they can, uh, you know, if they need it. They can, they can reach out.